Okay, so well, I'm absolutely delighted to say that we're joined uh, this morning by highly esteemed consultant urologist, Mr. Marcus Cumberbatch, to talk all things robotic assisted radical prostatectomy. So Mr. Cumberbatch, I suppose the, the first, maybe most important question, what exactly is a radical assisted, um, robotic assisted radical prostatectomy? First of all, Connor, uh, many thanks for that introduction. It's very kind of you. Um, so a prostatectomy is removal of the prostate, which is an organ in your pelvis. Uh, and as a man, it's the organ most commonly affected by cancer. And um, that op operation used to be done via what's known as an open operation, which is a big cut from the belly button down to your pelvic bone. And that would require a stay in hospital for a number of days. And we can get into the details of how that was performed maybe later. But these days, uh, the gold standard, uh, both in the UK and abroad, is to do this via a keyhole operation, uh, which involves five one centimetre nicks in the skin and something called a Da Vinci robot, or there are other robotic systems out there. And it's an operation that includes the use of these robotic arms to perform a very delicate removal of the prostate and potentially any sort of fatty tissues around the prostate to try and offer a cure for men suffering from prostate cancer. Excellent. Absolutely fantastic. And I suppose it must be a very modern kind of technique used now, very recently used. Yeah, I would say that the uh, robotic systems have been around maybe even as long as 20 years or so. But in terms of mainstream use and, and certainly becoming um, the gold standard, maybe that's only five, 10 years um, in certain countries, maybe longer in the UK probably about that time. We first got one in Sheffield in 2013, so about 11 years ago. And since then, it's really rocketed and its use is almost, uh, you know, almost 100% of cases are now done with the robotic systems. Fantastic. I, I suppose uh, when you have consultations with patients with regards to the surgery, are there any kind of doubts or are, are, is there um, a little bit of confidence now with patients? They, they become more they accustomed to this approach and they're more, I suppose, um, knowledgeable with regards to the surgery? Yeah, that's a really good question, Connor. I think you're right. When new novel technologies come along, there's always a slight reticence or a nervousness about how tried and tested is it or uh, how proficient is the pilot or, you know, the surgeon for that case. Um, I think the robotic system has been around long enough. There's enough patient information, leaflets and uh, websites out there that people generally are asking and double checking, actually. Th this is going to be robotic, isn't it? Um, and we can say with confidence that it is and that the patient's going to be operated on by a very high volume surgeon in almost all circumstances. Um, so I think nervousness, no, uh, confidence, yes. Um, and uh, I think patients really like the fact that it's so so detailed and that it's a magnified approach and that we you know we can really um, have a lot of trust in, in, in that. And also they love the fact they can go home, maybe even same day now. Uh, and certainly after one night's hospital stay, uh, back to loved ones, back to their own comfortable environment, start their recovery. That's absolutely fantastic. A huge benefit, really, of the surgery, isn't it? That, that they, can, they can go home same day, which is a, a such peace of mind as well. And it really gives them the confidence, like you say, not as much nervousness, a lot of confidence now from, from the patient's perspective, which is which it makes it easier for the surgeons as well. Oh, totally. You know, it is a joint decision making process. But if the patients have already bought into what you're about to say or have a, a good understanding, it really does help direct that conversation, you know, and uh, with all of these resources out there, um, showing patients videos or, you know, directing them to sites where they can watch videos or even hear um, these sort of webinars from patients who've been through it before. You know, it's it's so much easier and, and not just easier, but it's just comforting that patients are making a very informed decision. Uh, based on, you know, having had a real time to to reflect on lots of detailed information. Absolutely. Fantastic, Mr. Cumberbatch. Uh, leading us nicely on then to question number two. Uh, how does it differ from traditional open prostatectomy? Yeah. So I guess the first thing, Connor, is that what, what I was mentioning about the length of stay, you know, so there's a, there's sort of um, differences around what you might expect. So lower length of stay, less pain, um, smaller wounds. And then there's differences sort of from the surgical perspective. You know, um, we've got a, a at least 10 times uh, sort of surgical zoom magnification. You've got four arms rather than two because the robot affords you to use both your arms and your legs to sort of operate different parts of the machinery. So you've got really tight control. Um, and um, it means that you can perhaps perform a more delicate reconstruction. So 
the way that a prostatectomy is performed is um, you remove the prostate from the bladder and the urethra, which is the water pipe in the penis. And once the prostate is extracted from that site, you then have to reconstruct the bladder back onto the water pipe in the penis. And you can imagine these are quite delicate stitching processes that need to be done here. And the robot really affords you to do that in a very balanced um, and sort of symmetrical way. Um, and there are some studies which show reduced blood loss, perhaps better functional outcomes with regards to things like continence or even sexual function. Um, and also the ability to harvest some of the glands around the prostate that may or may not have cancer in some cases. So um, very much, um, I think that the sort of bottom line or the, the headline, should I say, in terms of the differences are, it's a, it's a more, uh, it's a softer, uh, less impactful, but very detailed way of removing the prostate that I think affords patients both a functional um, and potentially cancer outcomes, which are better. Fantastic. Uh, re really beneficial uh, in terms of, well, when compared to the traditional prostatectomy, much more comfortable, it seems, which is uh, fantastic again for, for patients. You hit the nail on the head. It's actually much more confident, comfortable, sorry, for the surgeon as well. You know, you're sat at a console operating this machine. Um, so ergonomically, much nicer as a surgeon to be doing this. You know, it can be lasting two hours, for example, for one of these cases. You're sat with a headrest. Uh, your arms are resting on a, on a plinth. You know, this is compared to sort of stooping over somebody's pelvis for two hours, um, stood up, you know, actually. And we've got to protect our workforce. So I think um, Absolutely. it's uh, ergonomically much nicer, too. <laughs> That's a great point. Uh, very beneficial for the surgeons as well. It, it takes a lot of the pressure off uh, physically much, much more comfortable, which is uh, fantastic. Oh, excellent, Mr. Kumarbach. And then the next question, then, uh, question number three, what are the functional outcomes then after a robotic assisted radical prostatectomy? Yeah, sure. So the ones that every patient wants to know about is how likely is it I'm going to be incontinent, which is the involuntary leakage of urine. Um, and, you know, potentially they might ask about their sexual function. Um, so those are probably the two functional things. We can get on to a little bit about when patients might be back to their normal level of conditioning for physical exercise, which is the sort of third thing that comes up. So in terms of incontinence, um, the studies show that about 5%, so one in 20 men by six months after the operation might still be leaking urine. And there are probably that 1% of patients where that's a kind of a miserable existence and they may need further treatments. So um, it's not that common, thank thankfully, but if it does happen, we often have to you know, help rescue patients with things like pelvic floor exercises and potentially further surgeries in extreme cases. What most men will experience is when the catheter comes out, which is a tube that's placed down the water pipe into the bladder to help secure the um, the exit of urine and to help the wounds to heal on the inside that's usually removed around 10 days after the operation and after that comes out most patients will leak urine their bladder is still trying to uh, recalibrate and, and get used to um, passing urine in this new way and, and often that means patients will have to wear pads um, they may need to just know where toilets are at all times but after a few weeks and there is a quite a dramatic improvement over the sort of weeks and months after operation men will get back to where they hope to be and in my experience um, it's 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 quite rare for patients to be uh, still troubled by that some months after the operation. Um, erectile dysfunction, however, is a lot more common um, and different air sources uh, will quote you different rates. My personal um, uh, quotes to patients is, you know, around 60, 70 percent of men will lose the ability to have a spontaneous, high quality, rigid erection after an operation like this. And it varies depending on how good their sexual function is going into the operation, how old they are, if they smoke and things like that. But in general, it will probably take a little bit of a knockback. But again, that can recover and actually can continue to recover up to two years after the operation. So not all is lost. And there's lots of patient information and specialist nurses on standby to help with that. And, uh, and we can certainly help men rehabilitate through that process. Um, and then the final thing was the conditioning. So we usually say things like don't heavy lift for six weeks, maybe don't ride a bicycle for about that amount of time. Um, you know, and just be uh, just be gentle in your recovery with exercise and, and uh, gym gym going. Uh, but patients can normally drive after a few days. They, they can fly after about four to six weeks um, and uh, will generally feel pretty much back to themselves after maybe two or three months. Fantastic. A very quick recovery, I suppose, can compare to the traditional prostatectomy. How, how do the recovery processes compare then? Yeah, well, in the immediate post-operative period, you're looking at a home, uh, home discharge one day after the operation compared to maybe five or six days. Um, there's a lot less of a um of a sort of surgical incision through muscle 
So that from that side of things, patients are a lot more comfortable. They can um, sort of strain, tense their abdomen with a lot more comfort earlier. Um, and um, and so th those are the definite wins early on. Longer term, there's probably a slightly lower chance of things like hernia formation with the robot, although I'm not sure that's pr proven uh, in any kind of research setting. But certainly uh, common sense was, would imagine that you are um, – you're from a wound perspective and just in general comfort you're going to recover more quickly um, i think downstream probably the differences aren't so noticeable but you know any early day wins are 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 really noticed by patients because that's when they're feeling their roughest so in some ways it's, it's just trying to help ease that kind of that first you know, big hit of the operation really and, and it makes it a softer thing you know you've got men going home the same day getting back to sort of golf after a couple of weeks you know you would be quite astounded by some of the um, stories that we see in clinic you know i don't want to know about all of them but uh some <laughs> of them, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that they're doing it <laughs> fantastic it's so good to see that patients can get back to themselves almost immediately you know after this major operation you know uh, it's a big procedure so fantastic really really excellent and then our, our next one then in terms of the oncological outcomes of the procedure what would they be yeah, so that's a really a good question. I think that um, oncologically, we can expect patients to do probably equally um, of doing either a robotic or an open operation. Um, and uh, even even more rare now is the laparoscopic um, operation that is um, adopting similar principles to the robot, but uh, not using the robotic technology keyhole, but uh, not robotic. And along the, when you sort of analyze all three, I think oncologically, uh, patients can expect good outcomes. You know, we only offer the surgery to patients who, you know, got a realistic chance of cure or, or who are accepting that it's part of a, what we call a multimodal approach. So this is kind of like a multi-pronged approach where um, we accept that they've got some high risk features, maybe on their scans or their blood tests um, or their biopsies. Um, but they're very keen to get the main, the bulk of the cancer out but we accept there might be a few little cells that have kind of leaked out of the prostate and might need some radiotherapy or some drug treatment. And so we only really go into it when we know the patients have informed that they've got one of these two kind of pathways in front of them. Um, and in general, uh, you can expect a clean removal of the prostate with no cancer left behind. But clearly a lot of that proof is in the um, recovery phase where we do three monthly blood tests for something called PSA which is a prostate uh, biomarker. This is a blood test looking for possible prostate cancer activity. Um, and also they may have some scans in their follow-up. And so with time, we get increasing confidence that we've given that patient a curative procedure. But with the magnification of the robot, you can really delicately peel off the tissues and be quite confident based on eyeballing it alone that you've, you know, that you've managed to, to get to get everything. And also you're armed with these beautiful MRI images, which are really, you know, evolving technologies all the time, which are incredibly accurate at telling us what the patient's burden of disease is. And we can just avoid the, the sort of near miss areas and just give them a wide berth in those areas just to make sure that we catch everything. Um, but even if patients do have a little bit of cancer left behind after their operation, all is not lost. We have very good salvage treatments, which include mainly radiotherapy, but also some drug treatments. And we can certainly help, um, to 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 offer that sort of second um second hit to the cancer if necessary but um yeah really good oncological outcomes i don't think it's really worthwhile quoting percentages because every patient's different they'll come with a different catalog of scans blood tests biopsies and it would get very complicated trying to get that story across um but in general if we think it's appropriate got a really good chance of cure Fantastic. Oh, excellent, Mr. Cumberbatch. And you touched on it there in terms of you know candidates and who is suitable for a robotic assisted radical prostatectomy but who would be the most mm -hmm. ideal candidates in your, yeah. in your opinion yeah so there's patient factors and there's sort of disease factors um so from a patient factor point of view ideally a younger patient uh, we generally don't offer surgical approaches to patients when they get to sort of over 75 and there's some pretty good data out of australia that shows that your functional recovery just drops off after that so that's kind of generally why we do that it's not an ageist thing it's just a we don't want to inflict functional damage on somebody who's going to really struggle to recover um we try and say keep your weight under us to a reasonable level um there's something called the bmi body mass index which kind of looks at your weight and height uh, ratios and we generally say that we want that value to be ideally less than 35 um maybe even you'd stretch to 40 but it just again it's going to affect how easy the operation is for the surgeon um, and things like your urinary incontinence rates afterwards 
Um, so uh, a younger patient, ideally um, someone who's in good shape and um, hasn't had previous abdominal or pelvic surgery. Um, in particular, sort of bowel surgeries can sometimes make it a little bit more challenging to do the operation. Um, in some ways, though, you can tackle a lot of different cases with these with this technology. It's just this is the perfect setting, really. Um, and um, in terms of the disease profile, you want somebody who has disease which is confined to the prostate, um, which is um, often given the, something called the T-staging of uh, either stage two or stage three. But if a patient was what's known as stage four, which is meaning the prostate cancer is kind of going into the bladder or the rectum, that's not really a surgical candidate. That's something which is going to be very difficult to completely cure with surgery. Um, and, and similarly, we just have to be a bit, little bit conscious about patients who've got really aggressive biopsy uh, or, or blood test parameters um, in terms of expectation setting. It doesn't mean they can't have the operation, but the expectation would be, again, this is likely to need uh, bolstered treatment afterwards. Absolutely. Excellent stuff, Mr. Cumberbatch. And then our, our last question then for this very, very insightful uh, interview in terms of the associated risks or how safe the procedure is. It seems very, very safe, but would there be uh, any sort of risks that the patients would be should be aware of? Yeah, so good question. I mean, the, so with the functional risks that we mentioned earlier, a lot of that go, it goes that gets down to sort of how patients are coming into the surgery. So what I maybe didn't mention in the last question is, you know, if your urinary um, continence and your sexual function are very good going into the operation, that that's ideal. Um, but nonetheless, even if you are in pristine health in that regard, then you're going to maybe experience a 5% chance of long-term incontinence, maybe a 70% chance of erectile dysfunction. There's a, a, a roughly 1 in 200, 1 in 100 chance of having your bowel injured during an operation like this. Thankfully, it's, it's not happened to me, but I've seen it happen. And, you know, it can often be rescued with um uh, at the time or in the in it may need further treatments and in extreme circumstances patients can end up with things like a stoma bag for a temporary period of time whilst their bowel heals but this is quite a rare thing to occur and in, in carefully selected patients can be avoided um you then have the risks of the anesthetic so it is a general anesthetic and i guess you know we have to be very careful to select patients who've got good hearts and lungs who can withstand an operation that takes two hours or so to be done um and then finally, there's always with any operation, uh, especially major cancer operations, risks of blood clots in the legs. So we protect against deep vein thrombosis with the relevant treatment. Um, there's a risk of infection, which is between 1 in 20 and 1 in 10. So we cover you with antibiotics during the operation. Um, you will potentially lose a little bit of blood. Generally speaking, it's very small, less than 50 or 100 mils in a lot of cases. Very unusual to have to have a blood transfusion. Um and uh, and the final risk is um, is the pain, which is often actually described to me as it feels like I've eaten a full Christmas meal or I've got a stitch like I've just been jogging because we are pumping your tummy full of a lot of gas to get the right views during this operation. Okay. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, patients do very well uh, when that sort of dissipates and, and, and your body gets rid of that gas. Patients are often comfortable and able to do a lot of things. There are some very, very rare risks such as hernias, um, which, you know, again, is uh, case by case, um, not something I often go into too much. Um, and uh, and then you've got to manage a catheter for 10 days. So there are risks with that sort of blocking off or patients becoming a little bit uncomfortable with that. But all things we've seen before and we have a, a very well-tried way of, of managing. Fantastic. Well, Mr. Marcus Cumberbatch, a very uh, insightful overview there um, about a robotic assisted radical prostatectomy. Many, many thanks again for your time and your detailed explanation about the surgery. And it seems very ben beneficial for, for patients. So thank you very much for your time. It's my pleasure, Connor. And uh, yeah, to anyone listening, uh, yeah, it's um, it's been a pleasure to, to be able to give you this uh, overview. And uh, thanks for dialing in. Thank you very much, Mr. Cumberbatch. And anybody who would like to check your profile out and maybe consult with you with regards to this uh, procedure, they can, of course, head over to your Top Doctors profile at www.topdoctors.co.uk and searching then for Mr. Marcus Cumberbatch and Top Consultant Urologists um, that can help you out for this surgery. So thank you very much, Mr. Cumberbatch. Many thanks for this time. You take care. Mm -hmm.